Good afternoon. I'm uh, going to talk about the North Sea Geothermal Project and uh, the purpose of the talk really is to get interested people together to network to develop geothermal energy in the North Sea. So putting geothermal into context, uh, if we look at the hydrocarbons, uh, they come out to just 0.4% of the total mass of the planet, which is what makes up the crust. The other 99.6% is hotter than 500 degrees C near the surface, going to 5,000 degrees C in the centre. And why North Sea geothermal? Um, if you can imagine Scotland, a little like an iceberg floating on the magma, um, where you have the mountain ranges somewhere back here, you have a very large mass going down into the magma. Uh, but as you go offshore, as, the, as you go into deeper water, then also the, the, the crust gets thinner and the magma comes up until you get a relatively thinner crust. And uh, the reason geothermal hasn't been developed to date in the UK is that that you have to draw a long way down. We're not near any fault lines or anything, but in the North Sea here, um, we, we find that there's uh, very high temperatures that can be tapped easily. Uh, if you look at the, the map of the North Sea, I mean, what would be very useful is there's any oil companies here that could, would be happy to log the, the depth of the well and the downhill temperatures so we could produce a, a 3D um, map showing the different contours of different temperatures to, to mark where the hot spots are in the North Sea. That would be very useful. But you know, just going through some of the statistics, there's about 100, 230 oil fields, 100 gas fields. There's over 2,900 oil wells drilled, 120 gas wells drilled. The main cost of tapping the earth is the cost of drilling the wells. And you know, luckily in the North Sea, we've got all these wells that are soon going to be decommissioned. There's 450 structures in the North Sea. A lot of them uh, made of concrete that have a, a useful life of 300 years. I mean, currently, the, the North Sea industry has only been going between 40 and 50 years, and uh, a lot of these structures still have a lot of useful life in them. So, you know, the question is, why decommission them? Why not find an alternate use? all of them, um, you know, there's a cost put to decommissioning of between 30 billion and 45 billion pounds. Um, you know, some of that money could be used for finding an alternate use for these structures. So uh, it's just something to think about, you know, that geothermal could be an alternative. Uh, another advantage of the, the rigs in the North Sea is that the most common way to tap geothermal energy is called enhanced geothermal recovery. What that involves is basically pumping water down one or two wells, um, allowing it to pass through fractured hot rock, and then allowing it to come up again through alternate wells back up to the surface, where it can go through a heat exchanger and, and uh, you, you know, it then goes into a clean working fluid that passes through the turbine. So, it's a, it's a completely carbon neutral system in that there's no, you're not burning hydrocarbons, you're just recycling the heat with, with, within a closed loop. So, um, you, you know, it's, uh, as I say, it's pollution free. Um, the, you know, the industry basically has the ability to create thousands of workers over the next 10, 20 decades. Uh, one to two decades. Um, there's, uh, as I say, it's got very little carbon dioxide footprint. So, you know, it's, it's a very clean energy. Um, I mean, I've already mentioned about the continental shelf being, being uh, 10 kilometers in thickness and on land it's between 40 and 70 kilometers in thickness. So, um, I mean, one of the comparisons I'm doing today is comparing geothermal to nuclear power stations. And the Scottish Parliament's already stated that it's not going to build any nuclear power stations within the Scottish borders. 
and uh, you know even a lot of the the English and Welsh um, uh, power ge nuclear power stations are actually finding it difficult to get contractors to actually build them, and so you know the, the whole nuclear industry is a little bit you know topsy turvy at the moment. That it's not clear how it's going to fully develop. But uh, what I'm saying is that geothermal is a similar type size of resource and uh, the, the many ways that, that, that it could be developed um, probably that will be clear on some of the future slides what I mean so perhaps it's best for me to move on um, in terms of you know the high temperatures that I've mentioned uh, an example is the Erskine field um, I mean the, the the uh, oil is coming out at 175 degrees centigrade at a pressure of 14,000 bars. You know, the shipping pressure was 10,600 psi at 150 degrees at the surface. I mean, we're in 300 feet of water, 150 miles east of Aberdeen. The Elgin and the Franklin fields are in a similar position. And again, um, perhaps if we look at the lower part of this, uh, there's a, a new record breaking uh, well was drilled to 6,100 metres with a temperature of 195 degrees C. So you can see that we're well above the boiling point of water, so it's very easy to create the steam and uh, you know, generate the power. Uh, I'll sh be showing later a range of different turbines that can be used. Uh, to generate power from as low as 80 degrees centigrade. So, um, this particular slide is from Baker Hughes, and they've got a, an enhanced geothermal demonstration scheme. Um, they've drilled down 10,000 metres. They've designed the drill bits, the, the mud motors, the muds. They've uh, designed geothermal ultrasonic fractioning fact, imager. <laughs> That, that will do the do the fracture mapping, uh, you know, once the wells have been drilled. So what I'm basically saying is the technology is readily available to go down to 10,000 meters, um, and uh, you'll see later why 10,000 meters is important in this discussion about uh, nuclear and geothermal. Um, what's being suggested is that um, to service the new geothermal industry that two new North Sea interconnect hubs uh, be built you know, about 100, 150 miles offshore, connecting the, the uh, Scotland with Norway, Denmark and Sweden, and uh, one again in the, low, in the southern field, connecting uh, Germany and Holland and, and the, the southern part of England um, to, to to basically use the energy from from uh, geothermal. So as we move on, um, this is coming back to the reason for the uh, 10,000 meters. I mean, if you look at the temperature here, it's talking about 310 degrees centigrade. This is the data from a, a Magnox nuclear reactor, uh, like the called that hole that you heard about earlier from the Sellafield representative. Um, the flow rate was 180 tonnes per hour of high pressure steam. The pressure is 2,000 pounds per square inch and the temperatures are 310 degrees centigrade. Um, now the, uh, the interconnectors that we've just mentioned are situated where there's about 35 degrees per kilometre depth. So to get 350 degrees um, then you need to go down about 10 kilometers. Uh, so, anyway, we'll move on. Um, so, are the drilling rigs available? I mean, Lamp Trail uh, has just been awarded a contract in May this year to build a, a, dr a jacket drilling rig that will drill down to 10,000 meters. It's designed to, to drill that, that depth. So, the, the drilling technology is available to, to drill down to 10,000 metres, so, um, you, you know, maybe in some of the 
the older wells um, that, that uh, you, you know, where there's a drilling rig already on the platform, maybe they may need upgrading to drill to dip deeper depths if they're not in a high pressure, high temperature field already. Um, so if you look at, uh, at this particular slide, the main difference of the, the above data you'll find is probably this, uh, the operating pressure was 200 PSI. Now, from the earlier examples, we're talking of operating pressures of 16,750 pounds per square inch. So, you know, there's a considerable difference in pressure. Uh, but again, by using a choke, it may be possible to, to limit the flow rates and reduce the pressure uh, to, to get a similar I mean, the beauty of uh, geothermal is, I mean, the magnets produce 40 megawatts of electricity uh, 24 hours, seven days a week, and geothermal's the same, you know, we're not, it's not subject to the, to the wind or the, the weather, like, like wind turbines are, you know, I mean, once you've drilled the wells, it will operate very similar to a nuclear power station, producing the power 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So. Um, we'll move on. I mean, the, the next question is how big a field do you need for the uh, 180 tonnes per hour of, of steam output? And uh, I think this question's going to be answered shortly by the, the uh, Scottish Renewable Roadmap team. They've commissioned two different um, types of research. On, on the geothermal potential in the North Sea from, from my previous talk in May at All Energy uh, 2012. And uh, the, the research results are, are due to be ready in the uh, spring of 2013. And also um, the, the licensing as well, which is mentioned in that paragraph there. And you, you know, probably soon after the spring, you'll be able to get licenses to develop the geothermal energy, uh, whether they are by temperature and depth, or whether they're going to be by the oil and glass blocks that are currently in place. It's probably better to stick with the block system. But again, the, the, you know, the, we'll know from from the Scottish office uh, which method they choose for issuing licenses. But uh, you know, from next. Uh, spring and summer, it should be possible to start developing the geothermal offshore. So we're making progress. <laughs> um, I put this slide in ju just to, um, uh, you, you know, I mean, one thing you might find is that when you're building nuclear power stations offshore, they won't actually fit on a on oil rig. So what I suggested, you know, that is Mulberry harbour built in the Second World War. Uh, the, the Royal Marines built a complete Mulberry Harbour of uh, 60,000 tonnes of concrete between 33 jetties with 10 miles of floating roadway between, you know. I mean, if they could do it in the Second World War, build large floating structures, then with today's technology, it's, you, you know, I mean, I go to Tenerife a lot and, and in uh, Santa Cruz, the the whole of the sea wall is actually floating, you, you know, it's, but the harbour wall is, 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 is just one floating mass, and the largest of the deep sea cruise ships, you know, tie up to it. So, um, you know, what I'm suggesting is that we build a safe harbour 150 miles out to sea with a, you know, an interconnector hub and, uh, you know, a geothermal nuclear sized power station. <laughs> Uh, you know, but, but not using nuclear, but using geothermal as a heat source uh, could be constructed. And what I'm suggesting is that, in, you know, instead of the jetties, that we we use the, the towers as anchoring points, you know, that the, the North Sea structures, that if they were all moved to one place and clustered and had floating sections between, you know, you could build quite a, a large town or, or a village. <laughs> Uh, you, you know, out at sea that uh, could have all the technology that's needed for a, a larger type, type um, building. Um, there's basically three types of geothermal energy, so I'll just mention them quickly. 
you've got geo pressure, that's really the the, the pressure of, of the wells, um, you know, and, and you know, you can imagine a hydroelectric scheme, all, all you're doing is using the head of water to drive the turbine. But you can use the same type of hydroelectric turbine on the on the wellhead pressures coming out of the ground to to create the electricity. The second one is that quite often when the oil and water come up as a brine, they have gas mixed in them, and if the gas isn't of commercial quantities, then you can you can burn the gas in, you know, if you like, and uh, piston engines or or jet engines, uh, and I put here diesel type generators, but you know, basically just use a a, a gas burning engine of some some sort to generate the power, and then using the temperatures, and uh, I'll be mentioning it later, the different types of of uh, uh, generators that are available, but as I say, the um, the nuclear one would be high pressure steam, and then you've got steam, you've got organic Rankine systems, and one called the Deluge uh, natural engine, which again I'll show you the slides of them in a minute. Uh, but they all work in different temperature bands and have different power outputs. So there's quite a lot of, of choice to temperature and bands. <coughs> Um, another area that's well worth considering, I, I mean, the, the government doesn't want to decommission the platform, but I think in the budget they put off decommissioning for about five years. And so um, an, another alternative would be to uh, extend the life of the platforms by doing secondary and enhanced oil recovery. If you're drilling down 10,000 metres, you can bring the heat up from the lower level, run it through the turbines, generate the power, and then it's still in steam form, so you can re-inject it, steam flood the oil fields, pressurise them and get the secondary oil recovered, and melt the heavy tar and the, the more viscous oils, and, re and recover the, uh, you know, I believe there's, uh, according to, to some of the statistics I've looked at, there's 50, sorry, 5,000 billion barrels available, which is twice the amount of conventional oil that, that, that won't be extracted because it, you, know, you need heat to melt it. Now using geothermal you can get the heat from a lower level, melt, melt the oils and, and recover larger quantities of oil. So that's something to consider. And then you've also got this further possibility that as you drill lower, you know, there's different layers of production sands in a reservoir as you drill lower for the geothermal you may well hit a lower reservoir of natural gas or oil, and again, and that will also ex extend the life of the, of the well. This is happening in Louisiana, that they've, they've, cho they've chosen there to drill the, the, the wells down an extra 500 metres, and uh, you know, all the easy to get oil has already been taken, but by drilling deeper, they're finding high pressure gas and uh, you, you know, uh, more oil reserves. And so the same thing could easily happen in the North Sea, uh, you know, if we choose to go deep. So. Anyway, um, cooling towers is another point I wanted to raise because with the with the cooler of the options, it, it's quite important. Uh, on land, you can only you, you know the average power station uses air cooling towers, and they get a wet bulb temperature of about 27 degrees centigrade. In the North Sea, you've got abundant cold water at about 5 degrees centigrade. So you've got 12 degrees difference that can be used, you know, using a, a low boiling point working fluid. You know, you can have the condensate level at a much cooler point uh, so, uh, and still get the power out. So as we move on, we'll look at some of the different turbine systems. Um, this one, a natural gas letdown generator. Normally, when you're working with gas, um, when you change pressures on the different mains, you, you, the, the energy is wasted. Uh, but using this system, uh, if I move on a little, I'll, I'll just jump to, to this slide, uh, uses what, what's called a twin screw expander. And uh, what that means basically is that as the, as the gas goes through it, it, it reduces the pressure down and generates power to generate electricity. So you know, it's just a, a way of generating power that's 
slightly different to a conventional power turbine that you see. Um, there's some statistics on it. Uh, the temperatures are across the bottom, the kilowatt outputs on the side scale here. These slides will, will be available later, so I don't really want to spend a lot of time on the technical detail, but you can look it up. I mean, for the nuclear possibility that we've been talking about, um, this company, Turbodem, uh, produce a 12 megawatt unit. Um, so to get 40 to 48 megawatts, you just put four of them in series with each other. And uh, you, you know, you're basically getting 48 uh, megawatts of power out. So um, this is a, a, what's called an organic Rankine cycle system. That's one that, that uses one of these low boiling point working fluids. Uh, that's slightly different to, to water, but as we go through the different systems, uh, this is the, the Deluge system. Um, it's called a hydraulic thermal engine, or a natural energy engine. And uh, I mean, the beauty of this system is that it's using, its working temperature is, is the highest temperature is 82 degrees centigrade, and uh, it just needs 100 degrees Fahrenheit temperature difference. So, um, uh, it uses liquefied CO2 as the working fluid, but doesn't change state, it's just expands and contracts quite a lot. Um, uh, CO2 has got quite unique properties of the working fluid. You know. uh, so, as I say, it's quite an interesting uh, system, this one. Um, this is one that I actually own the patent on myself, although the patent's lapsed now. But, uh, it was for a single borehole system that was basically designed to, to go into hydrothermal fields, which is basically a, a field of uh, hot water or steam where you'd have a natural convection current within the, within the field itself. Uh, you know, when you drill for oil and gas and you hit water or steam, the wells tend to get plugged in the back. You know, just, just bear in mind that it is possible to to, to put geothermal systems into these wells and generate power, you know. But when it, when it may have cost you 60 million pounds to drill the well, it seems a shame just to write off that investment, you know, when you could get an income by generating uh, electricity instead of, of producing oil and gas. So it's, it's just something to bear in mind. Uh, this one's quite a, an, an interesting cycle, the cleaner cycle. This is what's being used currently in Iceland. And this uses ammonia and water as a, as a working fluid. And they, they reckon it's got a 50% improvement over the, the standard organic Rankine cycle and a 20% improvement at higher temperatures. So again, the, the working band for that one's 150 degrees C to 212 degrees C. So, um, so as I say, what, what do you do with the electricity once you've produced it? Uh, you know, there's a few different options here. You can use it for off, offshore powering. You know, if you're doing secondary oil recovery, there's probably a need for, for additional pumping. And so you can use it to drive the pumps and things offshore. You can transmit it to shore to the electric grid using submersible cables, an example. Here, uh, you can convert it to hydrogen either on the rig itself using an electrolysis or bring, bring it ashore by cables and then, and then uh, you know, generate the hydrogen at the pump. So that would save you needing to, uh, to, to transport petrol or diesel as a fuel. Uh, Germany is already putting hydrogen uh, pumps in every petrol filling station in Germany by, by 2015. And I think the UK will follow quite soon after. Um, linked to offshore wind farms to help smooth supply, you know, because um, geothermal is a, is a fairly constant source of energy, then it's uh, possible that, that uh, you, you know, to take some of the, the lumps of supply from, from wind, you could, you could integrate geothermal into the same system. And they're building a lot of wind farms offshore in deep water, so you know, maybe that you can combine using their cables as well to get the power back to the UK. So, anyway, that's uh, an overview as, as to what, what, what uh, Dorsey Geothermal wants to do as a project and you know what we're 
doing at the moment is just collecting names, setting up a networking team to work on the, the project and to to get their different points of view and, and to, you know, because you, you can't actually do it until the government issues the licensing, which won't happen for about six months. But, uh, you know, we can start networking now and, and start preparing for when the licenses come out. So, I think okay. I'm about done. <laughs> so, first of all,